Welcome to the On Deck Circle podcast, powered by FantasySixPack.net. I am, of course, your host, Dave Eddy, and you can find me on Twitter at Corporal Eddy. Uh, this podcast goes along with my popular Dynasty rankings uh, that are also on FantasySixPack.net. You can find those updated at least every other Sunday. And as you probably know, if you're listening to this in between the weeks of the rankings, this uh, podcast will be getting dropped to discuss those rankings and, of course, answer some of the questions I get regarding to them and various different things from time to time. So if you have any questions about the rankings, of course, drop me a comment either on the article, on Twitter, on Reddit, or wherever else you may run into them. For this episode, episode number five, I'm very fortunate to be joined uh, with a new voice for this episode and and maybe even a staple of the show going forward. Uh, I have the fantasy king himself, Roy, with me. So, Roy, welcome to the show, my friend. How are things going for you? Thanks for the intro, Dave. Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you? I mean, I can't complain. It's about to be hot as balls here in Michigan again for the next week. Uh, so I'm not exactly looking forward to that, but a little bit of baseball will help to, to soothe that away. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you turn on ESPN these days, and I woke up early, and the only thing I was watching was Korean baseball. And <laughs> not that I'm not a fan of it, but I've, I've, I've seen better. Let's put it that way. So which um, Korean baseball player is currently your favorite thing? Because i got to tell you, I, I haven't seen a second of it, but I know that there's some names that, you know, we would recognize here in America that are over there playing right now. Um. I couldn't really tell you right now. I mean, there's a few of the pitchers that I'm watching because I, I don't really trust the hitters as much because I think the stats are inflated. But there are a couple of good pitchers that, you know, they have de- decent velocity. And I think, you know, they might translate a little bit. But um, I'll have some names for you next time. How's that? So this might be a dumb question because I probably should know the answer to this. But um, is that KBO? Is that the same league that Josh Limblom came from? Yes, it is. Okay, that's what I thought. He was actually the the MVP last year. Right. um, Which is why I'm mentioning him as, you know, a a, a bit of a a sleeper among the pitching cat, among the starting pitchers, because he actually led the league in ERA. And to have a two and a half ERA in a league where, you know, you're scoring that much runs, it's, it's quite a rarity. And, you know, the most famous pitcher that came from that league, obviously, is Ryu, now on the Blue Jays. Yep, you're naming a lot of names here that people know. Um, I'll tell you, well, a little bit of backstory here. So so I've known Roy for, what, like a decade or so? Um, yeah, it's been about 10 years. Yeah, it's been about 10 years. He's actually the commissioner of a, of a league that obviously we're in together. Um, and so that, that's how I've gotten to know him a little bit over the years. And um, the league that we're in together is, I think... I think the only league I, I haven't taken the shot on Limbaugh, Matt. And it's not that I haven't tried. It's just that I haven't acquired him. So um, I like the fact that, you know, you say you're in on him as a sleeper because I completely agree. I think he's a pretty low risk, low risk. I wouldn't necessarily say high reward, but, you know, medium to high reward um, pitcher for, you know, at least this year. Obviously, he's not young, but he's not too old. So you could get, you know, three, four, five quality years out of him yeah i agree with you he, he's, he's about 30 years old and um my my major concern with him is that he didn't really have much of a you know track record when he was with the mlb i mean he was a hard thrower but he never he never found his command which supposedly he now has found in korea and um and the other part that bothers me is his is his park i mean obviously you know playing at miller park there's going to be a lot of home runs so he may be one of those guys where he's a better whip candidate for you. You know, good, uh, decent whip, good strikeouts, but I don't expect an ERA, you know, probably hovering around four, I would say. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would honestly say the team that he's with is almost bittersweet because you're correct about, you know, the ballpark factor. But they also, you know, were desperate for pitching, uh, starting pitching specifically. So, you know, it, it definitely was a good signing, I think, both ways, you know, where it gave them, you know, a, a pitcher that, you know, has the potential to be impactful. And it gives him a, a chance to come back over, you know, to the States and, and have a real opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's a they have a lot of candidates, so we don't know how their rotation is going to shake out right now. I mean, you've got, you know, a former top 50 prospect, Corbin Burns, who may or may not have a shot at that fifth spot. You've got Freddie Peralta, who tore it up, you know, in the in the winter leagues. He was supposedly hitting, you know, 98, 99. So they have a lot of candidates. But um, the, the good news for Lindblom is that he definitely is you know, going to occupy one of those starting spots. So he's he's definitely somebody to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely agree. So, um, I mean, since, since we're talking about, you know, this upcoming season, um, I, I'd like to jump ahead here um, in our notes a little bit and, and talk about how to approach the shortened season. Um, I, I, you know, for the purposes of of this podcast, we're, we're focused solely on on dynasty, so it's not so much a redraft thing, of course. Um, but I mean, what is your advice for how to approach, you know, twenty twenty a sixty game shortened season uh, for for a dynasty league or for a dynasty okay. team? I should say specifically. Sure, I would say um, I think the number one thing this year is going to be your depth. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll always talk about depth being important, but we can't. I, I can't really understate how important it is this year especially among the starting pitching i mean my my main goal in all my leagues is to target as many starting pitchers as possible um and i'll even you know in dynasty leagues i'll even sacrifice a few spots that i normally would um have reserved for some prospects or some younger players because um in most of my leagues i'm fortunate enough to have a good team so i'm pretty much all in so i mean my I, my, my secret of fantasy leagues is I go for the high upside, high return guy. So among the starting pitchers, I'm always going to target the guys who get a lot of strikeouts and the, the good whip. Yeah, I mean, you, you basically, you know, said exactly, you know, what, what I think is, is key, and that's depth. We have no idea what's going to happen in the 60-game season, but... I mean, depth seems like the most obvious answer because you're going to have people that contract, you know, the virus that, that don't have it already. Um, and they're going to be, you know, out for a couple weeks. You're going to have, you know, just all sorts of oddities that, that come with a short season. Um, you know, when a guy needs a day off and, you know, he, has, you know, he, he misses, you know, just a game for rest, that then becomes, you know, a, a bigger chunk of the season than, you know, somebody just sitting out, you know, during a 162 game season. So, uh, depth is, is definitely key. Um, I mean, pitching wise, I, I usually would say, you know, for me in a dynasty league, depth is, is important. I think it's very difficult, if not impossible to, you know, acquire enough top end starting pitching that, you know, you can roll with, six seven guys um and be super competitive what i would rather do personally is i'd rather get a you know a a staff if you will you know 15 20 guys deep and you know roll that way and and almost try to you know win by just out producing you know counting numbers as opposed to trying to be dominant because what you know pitching is so volatile to begin with uh, with hitting, it, it's a little different for me. With hitting, I would rather, you know, go ahead and go after the high upside guys. Um, you know, go get your elite players because they're going to play pretty much every day, um, and they're a lot less volatile. So, I mean, that's in a nutshell kind of my strategy is elite bats and just throw a ton of arms and see what sticks. I agree with that. I mean, I'm, I've always been a big believer that the bats are going to be – more stable than the arms um which is why i try to have a rotation where you have hopefully four or five horses 
you know, those guys that are good year in and year out. And then, you know, you have you have a lot of depth with, like I said, high strikeout, low whip guys, because they tend to be the most stable, you know, year in and year out. And be very aggressive on the waiver wire because pitching, as you said, is very volatile. And there's guys that may not have been good last year who may all of a sudden come on the scene. Um, you know, some guys I'm sure we all know, but, you know, I mean, guys that I'm targeting in pretty much all my leagues, I mentioned a couple of them to you already, Corbin, Corbin Burns and Freddie Peralta, but some other names to keep in mind. You've got Josh James on the Astros who may get, you know, the fifth pitching spot, and he has, you know, practically unlimited upside. You have Julio Urias, who may finally be a mainstay in the Dodgers staff, and you've got Ross Stripling, who's produced great numbers whenever he's had a shot, and those are just some of the names I would keep in mind. I tell you, the last thing that I read about Josh James yesterday um, was I believe they've got him penciled in right now to be their number four starter. Yeah, I mean, um, with Urquidy being on the injured list, it, it pretty much gives him, you know, almost a, I don't want to say it's a guaranteed spot because you never know what the Astros are going to do. They're, they're not very kind to breaking in their prospects, as anybody who's got Kyle Tucker knows. But hopefully we can, you know, he says he can get up to 75, 80 pitches now. So it would be really nice to see James have some chi- time to develop because, there's few guys with more upside than him, you know? Yeah, and of course, you've got McCullers in that same rotation. And, you know, even before shortened season, you didn't know exactly what you're going to get with him. It sounds like he's good to go. Um, and he would be a guy that, you know, I would add to your list of, you know, guys to watch. Because if he does come back and he's healthy, I could I could definitely argue that having a shortened season is is the the perfect you know solution for someone like McCullers to let him get technically a full season in while only playing a third of it oh absolutely I mean he's 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 got the pedigree and he and he has the numbers so um yes if his only thing is how much command will he have early in the season so you want to you know I, I haven't heard too much of the reports but based on the velocity I've heard the velocity is back so now it's just going to be a matter of how soon is the command go, going to be there. But he's definitely, you know, one of the more, you know, most promising guys there. So here, here's a random question to throw at you then. Two, two years ago, I think this would have been a, a dumb question. And mo- a lot of people probably wouldn't even have heard of half of this question. But going forward today, if you had a choice between Josh James and Lance McCullers, who would you take? I still have to go with McCullers because based on the overall body of work and their, you know, and their history to date, I mean, McCullers, um, as a Yankee fan, it pains me to remember it. But I mean, he was burying curveball after curveball and just striking out Judge and Stanton and Sanchez. So, I mean, the the great thing about McCullers is, you know, when, when he was healthy, his command of his curveball was exceptional. And his fastball is, you know, one of the better ones, too. I mean, he, he gets it up there into the upper 90s. So as much as I like James, while his upside may even be higher than McCullers, I can't place him above McCullers right now, you know. You have to give the edge to the vet. So so then let, let me take that one step further then. Um, so McCullers over James. So would you rather have... Uh, Grinky or McCullers going forward in a dynasty? I'm, I'm sorry, Zach Grinky? Yes. Oh no, I would definitely go with. with um, uh, I would I would go with the, the younger guy. So I would go with James. Okay, that's kind of what I was I was getting to there is, um, you know, in some of these dynasty startups um, that I've been doing, I've been doing some mock drafts as well. Guys like Verlander and Scherzer have been have been dropping quite drastically, um, and I, I don't have. The sheets in front of me, but they've been going well outside the top 50 um, because, you know, the the whole age thing, of course, you know. Um, and so it's just, it's always interesting to me. Um, and every owner will be a little bit different because obviously it depends if you're trying to win right away or if you're, you know, building a little bit for the future because uh, the Max Scherzer has obviously a tremendously different value to a team that's competing for, you know, 2020 as compared to a team for 2022. So it's always interesting to see 
you know how people will will value a guy like let's say um, let's say Joey Gallo over Julio Rodriguez. You know some people would be 100% all in Julio Rodriguez, and other people wouldn't touch him, and they would take the you know the Joey Gallo. So um, it's just interesting to get in someone's mindset like that sometimes. Sure, and and I mean it, to me. Um when you're talking about a dynasty draft like that, to me, it's all about value and where, where you're getting the guys. Like I would never not draft somebody like Verlander just because you may only have, you know, one, two, you know, I would say at best three years to left, but it's a matter of where you're getting him. Like if you're going to take, I mean, I would obviously always take a Verlander over um, even, even a Josh James at this point, but you know, then it becomes a matter of, how how early in the draft are you going to draft a Josh James? You know, I think at this point you could still wait on somebody like that because as talented as he is, there's still a number of guys in that category that you can get practically equal value. Yeah, a guy like Josh James, you're going to be able to get super late unless some, you know, Astros homer jumps up ahead of you. Right. So with this upcoming season, I know there's been... Uh, at least a lot of debate in the industry about you know what to do with leagues that are traditionally head-to-head and if it makes sense for them to continue with the head-to-head or to do kind of a you know a makeshift roto league just for a year uh you know just because head-to-head is is not really designed for such a short season so um you want to take a minute and just kind of talk about um, you know, how you came to your decision about our league, which is traditionally a head to head league, um, and what sure. you think just in general? Yeah. I mean, um, it, it, it was a tough call because obviously, uh, Roto is more geared to a short season in the sense that it's, it's, it's basically just the accumulation of stats. You know, so you have, you have a longer season to accumulate stats. I think that would have been the main benefit. Because if you combine the first two periods, because the season starts on a Thursday and not all the teams are going to play on that Thursday. But in most of my leagues, what I've done is I've combined the first two scoring periods so that the the scoring period runs about, you know, 12 days versus the standard seven days that you're going to get, whether it's a daily or a weekly. So you basically have nine weeks in the season if you go if you play from beginning the 23rd to september 27th so my my main objective was i was trying to think of a way if i could still maintain the head-to-head you know integrity of the league and get it done that's what i always preferred and i i felt that the schedule lended itself to just enough time to get it done because most of the leagues allow you something called the multiple matchups per week okay and for anyone not familiar with that in a head-to-head what it basically means is rather than just say me playing dave for that week we can actually have while i'm playing dave dave could play two other teams and i could play two other teams so basically even though you have only a seven week season if you play out three teams per week you can pretty much simulate the same results that you would hold for a full season now obviously the major drawback there is you still have a compressed time in which to accumulate the stats which is still that seven weeks so if your team gets off to a bad start you're not going to do well this year well i i will say you know i i very strongly prefer any league to do roto this year um head to head just you know on its own is already kind of I wouldn't say gimmicky, of course, but it's, it's already very fluky, um, you know, and typically, you know, I'm one of the, the better owners in, in a league that I'm in. So if I can eliminate as much luck as possible, that typically goes to my advantage. But in such a short season, I think that, you know, the luck factor now just, you know, multiplies, you know, tenfold at least. And so... I think whenever you do the multiple matchups per week, I think now you even more greatly exasperate, you know, how how much luck you put into things. The the one good thing about head to head is that, you know, you, you face one team each week. If it's in a league like ours where everyone 
pretty much you know knows each other has been in the league for an extended period of time you know that could be kind of fun to to trash talk and you know uh you know just to have that kind of you know see, you know a, a series kind of a feel when you when you go you know three different teams each week now it's it takes away some of the strategy for me to look at it and say well you know what i'm not going to start you know this particular pitcher this week because i've got a nice lead in you know era or something or you know maybe you take a couple of your closers out and, and put in some middle relievers to try to win holds because you've got a nice lead in saves I, I think you eliminate a lot of the strategy there because unless you have that same situation against all the teams that you're playing you're really just trying to field the best overall team that you can because you've got three completely different matchups that you're you know competing at the same time yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. And just to give you a little bit of background, I mean, I've been I've been playing fantasy baseball for o- over thirty years, and I, I will admit, the first the first fifteen, I was all in on Roto. I mean, that was that was pretty much the only league I would play because I thought it was the most realistic, you know. But then, um, and I still believe that to a degree. I mean, if you're trying to just um, go purely by stats, Roto will always be more realistic because you're dealing with a longer time period and you're not going to have, you know, the individual matchups, which are going to hurt you. But then um, I would say the last 15 years, I've been in, you know, purely in head-to-head leagues. And I guess the main basis for that is the fact that, you know, in real life, it is all head-to-head. So even though I think there's a bigger luck factor, I think head-to-head offers more skill and like you said, more trash talking. So for that reason, I knew going in that this was going to be a bit of a fluky year, but I just didn't want to, you know, have a one-year roto in leagues like, you know, the one we're in, where for 10 years we've been doing head-to-head. So that was just continuity and consistency were my main objective. Yeah, I can, I can totally see that where, you know, you just want to keep that continuity of a head-to-head. And, you know, either way, it's a it's a short, weird season, and we don't know how it's going to play out or even if it's going to fully play out. So no matter what you do, I think there's some sort of a, you know, quote-unquote asterisk that goes on to it. So, you know, you could definitely argue that changing the format for – one abbreviated season just almost isn't even worth it so um, either way you go you know I I think everyone's just happy to have baseball back and you know have a little bit of fun in whatever fashion we can in our leagues is better than you know continuing to watch Korean baseball oh absolutely because I mean at this point honestly it's like aside from watching my son's travel baseball and now looking forward to MLB starting you know hopefully you know this Thursday there's really, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uncertainty going forward. We don't know if we're going to see college football. Um, we don't know if we're going to see NFL football. Um, college just has a whole different, you know, issue having to do with the students and the travel. And based on what I'm hearing, the pro football is all going to be based on how much they can control this the spread of the virus. They know they're going to have positive tests. And it's all a matter of how much is it going to decimate the teams. Yeah, there, there's so much unknown that it's almost impossible. I mean, we were talking about, you know, something as unimportant as, you know, fantasy baseball. But it, it definitely translates to to that 100%. And, you know, you've really just got to determine exactly, I think, what your approach is going to be. And whatever that approach is, just, you know, stick with it, go all in on it. And again, it's it's going to be a fluky season no matter what you do. So I think it's best to just kind of pick your direction and, and go forward with it. And then hopefully come 2021, we will be back to quote unquote, you know, uh, normalcy. I hope so. I mean, I, I have to tell you, as much as I'm looking forward to the fantasy league starting, it's absolutely killed me that they canceled the minor leagues. I mean, yeah, a lot of the top prospects, you know, your Kalenix and your Julio Rodriguez, your Joey Adels, they're up in the majors. And we got and we get some tees every now and then, you know, hitting, you know, hearing who's hitting a home run 
off the you know the major league starter but the fact that the, the minor leagues for the most part have shut down for a whole year I, I can't tell you how depressing that is to me I'll tell you I, I'm gonna be very very selfish here for a second and let me tell you the the worst part about the minor league season for myself um, as you know um, I work for uh, prospects 1500 covering the Detroit Tigers and because I live here in Lansing, uh, I'm, I'm almost within walking distance of the Lansing Lugnuts. And through our relationship with um, the Lugnuts and um, you know their, their staff and then my affiliation with Prospects 1500, uh, I was able to uh, obtain a media pass for the season. And it was you know very much something I was looking forward to, uh, you know, hitting, you know, a couple games at least every single week and, you know, seeing, you know, all of the, you know, best prospects that the Midwest, you know, league has to offer. And of course, that's the year that the season gets shut down. So um, that was really disappointing. And I'm hoping in 2021, like I said, everything comes back to normal because, uh, you know, being able to get eyes on multiple times, you know, a lot of these, you know, prospects that we talk about, um, was something that I was tremendously looking forward to. Yeah, I, I can totally sympathize with that. I mean, um, you know, I've been to a couple of the you know the minor league parks, and you know, for anybody who hasn't been out there, it's it's just a great great time. I mean, it's seeing these players that you've read about, you know, and you're looking forward to him them eventually reaching the major leagues. But I, I mean, it's it's the atmosphere. Um, that to me is really so joyful when you when you get to those parks. It's it's all about the baseball and watching the kids play and having fun. And it's it's we're gonna miss it this season. But like you said, hopefully it's back and and better than ever next year. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how the prospect development you know continues because I th- I guess I don't know, but I feel like having a minor league season is probably at least overall for you know prospects in general you know a better way for them to um, develop because you know there's only you know 60 man you know squads for each team and obviously you know you're only getting you know a lot of major league talent of course and then you're only getting the you know the the top tier prospects um, you know with most of these teams so the kids that aren't in that mix are kind of on their own but it also then makes it very interesting to see which guys, you know, the teams maybe value the most um, because those are the guys theoretically that are on these taxi squads. So, sure, you know, you see guys that have zero chance of playing this year, like, you know, a Noel Marte, Marte, uh, Marco Luciano. I mean, these guys are on those taxi squads, but I mean, I can't envision a scenario where Noel Marte Marte plays an inning i mean he's just there for development so um, exactly yeah i mean that's the thing too because like i think when they originally announced these 60 man squads and you heard about these players i think some people might have thought that wow are we going to see them in a game and while you may see some of the guys who are much much closer you know like an adele I think for the most part, it was done, like you said, it's for development purpose, just so that they could be close to the major league scouts. They could watch their swings. They could watch, you know, the pitchers release points. And then just to make sure they get in the reps this year so that they're not completely rusty. Yeah, and I think that the guys that are in that position probably have their development, like, accelerated because, you know, if if you're in there facing major league talent, um, and playing with major league talent and, you know, just kind of being in that environment, I think that will prepare you better than, you know, going and playing in the mid- Midwest League for a full season. But the one thing that really interests me, um, and I'll just give one specific example, is it makes you kind of question guys that may be in the industry that we value pretty highly, but did not make the taxi squad that, that are kind of a head scratcher. And then I think the biggest name um, that I can think of, and it's maybe it's just because it's the guy that I'm in love with, but um, Christian Robinson did not make the taxi squad. But guys like, you know, Alec Thomas, Corbin Carroll, they're all there. So it makes you wonder why. 
And of course, you know, the most obvious conclusion would be that maybe they are just not as high on him. But I mean, I guess we don't know, but it's very interesting. I would say I, um, I would take a bit of a different approach to it. I don't think it's that they're not as high, but I think that because you're talking about a guy who's just so far away at this point in, you know, in, in, in low A, I don't think they wanted to overwhelm him. That would be my guess because, I mean, his his upside is up there with anybody's, you know, including all the big names, whether it's um, Luis Robert or, or Joe Adele. So I don't think it's that they're not high on him because I, I know that he's, you know, that they, they think the world of him. I just think they don't want to overwhelm him. That would be my guess. Well, in either way, you can just make one simple comparison and say, you know, Corbin Carroll is on that is on that taxi squad and Christian Robinson isn't that there's somewhere there was a decision made to say Carol. Yes. Robinson. No. And we're left to speculate on the reason why. Right. I mean, my, my only guess there would be because Corbin Carroll, he played through at, at the highest levels of high school ball. He, he attended all the perfect game tournaments. So even though their ages may be similar, I think Carol may be maybe a year older. I know it's, I know they're both very close. They probably just feel overall that Carol might be a little bit more advanced at this point. That would be my guess. I don't think it's any indication of what they think their you know prospect um, ceiling is. And I, I could be wrong on this point, but uh, I do think that they have the ability to to maneuver the guys on that taxi squad. So. If that is correct, it's certainly not impossible for them to have some sort of a, a plan for Christian Robinson where, you know, halfway through the season, you know, he replaces whomever um, and, and, and gets up there with that taxi quad. So if that is the case, as I understand it to be, it could just be, you know, it could just be a thing where, you know, they want to get some early looks at maybe some other guys that they're not as sure about. And then once they've kind of seen what they need to see from them, they can just plug Robinson in because maybe they are confident in, in what they have in him. So that's a possibility. Right, right. Um, so let, let's move on we, to what I think was some of the, the bigger news um, that's not necessarily, you know, COVID related. Um, and that came out last week that at least in this summer camp that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is um, going to be focusing solely on first base and DH. And as a Vlad owner, as a matter of fact, as a Vlad owner who acquired him from you personally. Um, <laughs> don't remind me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't. Do you recall the, the details of the trade? I, I'm pretty sure I gave you three, three high quality starting pitchers. Do you remember who they are? Because I don't. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. You gave me Walker Bueller. No, um, Lucas no, no. Giolito no. and Chris Paddock. I gave you Walker Bueller. Are you sure? Yeah. I don't remember owning Walker Bueller in that league. You're 100 percent sure. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Well, I don't like that deal so much. Then I didn't know it was Walker Bueller. <laughs> I remember Giolito and I remembered Paddock, but I couldn't remember the the third person. Okay. Well, either way, Vlad is my favorite player in baseball. So sometimes, you know, to get a guy that I'll be honest with you, I think is going to be a Hall of Famer when everything's all said and done. Um, I know he's 21, and that's probably quite a statement to make, but that's how confident I am in this kid. Um, him moving to first base was something that I, I think was inevitable, but I didn't think he was going to do it at age 21. I thought it might be somewhere down the road, um, you know, maybe even, you know, somehow involving getting, you know, Austin Martin on the field later on. But for him to move to, you know, first base this early was quite a surprise for me. And at first I was kind of disappointed but in retrospect um you know once i've had a chance to look into a little bit more you know first base is pretty shallow so if you can take and and add that to you know vlad's profile there and and put him at first base i i would actually now argue that it increases his value and i already think that he is a little bit down as far as the industry is concerned um you know after he didn't dominate in you know the big leagues in 2019 um now i mean people are a little bit unfair in my eyes 
because very few prospects have, have came up and played at a high level right out of the gate. So that is not the norm. But we have seen guys like Acuna and guys like Tatis come up and just dominate right from the beginning. So, you know, when Vlad goes out there and basically is average, um, people have frowned upon that. And, you know, when you look at his stat cast data, there's nothing that stands out really positive. Um, I mean, hard hit percentage, 47th percentile. Uh, X slug 42 percentile barrel percentage 47 percentile I mean everything is basically right in the middle and people are frowning on that but you know it's important to remember that this kid's still 21 he is you know not too far removed from being you know the unquestioned consensus you know number one prospect in the game and all in all I mean he really didn't perform badly. Um, I mean, specifically against a fastball, which you would expect him to be able to, to handle pretty well. He hit 306 last year on the fastball with a 476 slugging. That's pretty good. Off speed pitches, 291 with a 556 slugging. Again, uh, for a 21 year old kid, first taste in the major leagues, I would classify that as a huge win. Where he struggled, is exactly where I think you would expect to see him struggle, and that's against breaking balls. So he, he batted 227 with only a 343 slugging. But I would say, again, like I said, that's pretty common, you know, for a very young hitter to be seeing the absolute best pitching in the world for the first time. The breaking balls are where you would expect to see him struggle, and, and that's where he did. Um, now, assuming he has third base eligibility going into you know even 2021 I think that then vaults him into being even more valuable and I I think that you'd be crazy if you couldn't say that he was at least potentially if not for sure a a top five dynasty asset going forward specifically once you add first base eligibility to that so those are my thoughts I'm a Vlad Homer so I, I guess I'm usually a little higher than most anyways but as someone that's maybe more reasonable, Roy, what, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I don't know how much more reasonable I'll be because I pretty much share um, everything you just said. I mean, I remember, you know, seeing videos of this kid hit when he was 16. And um, there's a reason why people were that high on him. I mean, yes, I mean, you, you gave a lot of stats that might give you a little bit of pause but i think the bottom line we all have to remember is he was a rookie last year and he was a young rookie um and he didn't play all the year before because he had some injuries so i think when you when you look at the when you look at the whole body of work i mean unfortunately it's going to be a guy like a juan soto that spoils us you know that 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 kid that comes to the majors and you know if anything he's better than he was in the minors and he makes the transition look so simple, but that's not really the case with most players. Most players have that learning curve. So um, Vlad's disappointing rookie year in no way has tempered my expectations. I still think that he's going to be, you know, a a triple crown candidate um, in a lot of those years. And I agree with you that the hall of fame is a, a definite possibility. Um, I would say in terms of the, the fantasy fantasy value, it's it's a funny thing. I, I think a lot of us are so locked into the mindset of certain positions being so-called scarce positions that we don't really notice the trend that's happening today. Like, for example, if you asked the average fantasy owner, he's still going to refer to shortstop as a scarce position, when in fact it's not. And it's going to be the same thing with third base. So a lot of our value judgments are based on perception. And the reality is Vlad going to first base is actually a boom to his fantasy value. Because with the exception of maybe Peter Alonzo, there is no real young stud at the position. I mean, I would uh, Cody Bellinger with his eligibility there. Um, is you know the clear number one guy, but a full time first baseman. To me, it's Vlad, and then you know the next tier. Right, and with Cody, um, with Cody Bellinger, a lot of what I'm hearing coming out there is that, especially with the universal DH, 
Cody is going to pretty much play center field, is, is my understanding. And Muncie is going to be handling first base going forward um, with Lux taking over second base. So we may not see Bellinger too much more at first base. And depending on your league's eligibility, how generous it is. I mean, if you're in one of those leagues that you only need five games played, yeah, you'll probably get it. But if you're in one of those leagues that needs 25, 30 games at first, I'm just not sure that I would rate Bellinger as a first baseman going forward. But, you know, this year is going to go a long way to answering that question. And, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I guess I'll toot my own horn for a second. I'm lucky enough in our league that I've got Bellinger on the team and currently in in at first base. And I've also got Vlad. So um, if Bellinger loses first base eligibility, I have Vlad that's going to be playing there anyways. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, personally, I could give a shit less if Bellinger maintains that first base eligibility, though it would be nice, but you know, a lot of people aren't in that position, but either way, if Bellinger just simply becomes, you know, an outfield option, he, his value is a top, at least four player doesn't, doesn't get altered. I don't think. Right. And I mean, you know, the, 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 the uh, additional good news that, that I heard about Vlad um, and, and I was equally shocked with you about the move to first base because all the reports that I got in the off season was that he worked out like a demon and he dropped a lot of weight. And I mean, while he wasn't great last year and the stats would show that he was one of the, um, you know, worst third baseman defensively. I mean, based on reports that I heard, you know, in the field, he, he was moving pretty well. And especially in training camp this year, they said he was moving e- even better. So I was surprised, but maybe they just want to give him, uh, let him, my guess is that they want him to focus solely on the bat and they don't even want the defense to be a concern. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of Vlad, um, you know, not only in the minor leagues, but um, I, I watched him a little bit. I watch him a lot on TV, but I, I watched him in person last year as well and I've always thought that you know the metrics were a little bit unfair and I think a lot of people just look at his body type and go oh that guy can't play the field that well and I've I've always thought he was an adequate third base I mean um I just I think that I I don't know if it's I don't know we'll we'll see exactly how much he plays it's easy for them to say we're going to focus on first base and then he just you know continues to play third but yeah, I, think, I mean, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 a, I'm a big believer in the defensive metrics, but I will say for years and years, they also told us that Derek Jeter was one of the, you know, was a below average defensive shortstop. And I got to tell you, having seen him pretty much every day, being a beloved Yankee fan, he, he, he was very good out there. I mean, he may not have been gold glove the, the last half of the year, but um, I'm a big believer in the stats which I'm sure we'll get into in another show, but stats aren't everything. You, you, it, 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 it does come down to the eye test. Yeah, and I mean, with, with this 2020 season, everything is, is so up in the air that I really think, like I said, you just kind of pick your direction, stand fast at it, and, and see what happens. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, well, I think with that, um, I think, uh, Mr. Fantasy King, I think we shall call this show a wrap. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, it's, I had fun, Dave. It's not often that, you know, I invite someone on that's smarter than I am, but I, I figured I'd, I'd give it a whirl and see what happens. So um, I do appreciate your time, and I, I look forward to many more discussions with you that will almost certainly get much more in-depth. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I love talking about stats and how players are doing. So once we get underway, I'm sure that we're going to have, you know, we'll actually have to be cutting back on the topics we can cover just because we won't have enough time to cover all of them. Well, we did that this week already because I, I took one off the list so that we could cover it another time. That sounds good. We'll put a topic to list next time. Absolutely, my friend. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and – and play some intro music on the way out and we will see everyone next time for episode six